Attention truth seekers and probability enthusiasts, the time has come to unlock the secrets of the universe. In this episode, we'll embark on a mind-bending exploration of Bayes' theorem and its astonishing implication and the potential to predict everything. Yes, you've heard that right, everything. From the weather on Mars to the winner of the next year's lottery, Bayes' theorem offers a powerful tool for making informed guesses about the future. Now hold back your hats, Bayes' theorem isn't something mystical like a crystal ball. It's a mathematical framework that allows us to update our beliefs based on the new evidence. Let's say you hear a strange scratching sound coming from the attic. That's a prior probability. You might believe that it's a harmless squirrel. That makes sense, right? But then you see a shadowy figure just dart across the window. Oh, wait, that's some new evidence. And suddenly your belief is that it's a sneaky raccoon that skyrockets. You know, just your basic posterior probability. See, with every new piece of information, Bayes' theorem helps us refine our predictions. The more data we gather, the closer we get to a clear picture of what's happening or what might happen, right? So... Imagine a world where weather patterns are no longer a mystery and where market trends can be accurately forecasted, where even the next technological breakthrough can be predicted in a high degree of certainty. Bayes' theorem, my friends, holds the keys to unlocking this level of understanding. But it's foolproof. Can we truly predict everything? That's a question that we're going to grapple throughout the show. So join me, Autumn Fanaf your host at Breaking Math Podcast, in this episode to chat with Tom Shivers, an author and award-winning science writer for Semaphore. His writing has appeared in The Times London, The Guardian, New Scientist, Wired, CNN, and so many more. His books include The Rationalist Guide to the Galaxy, How to Read Numbers, and last but not least, Everything is Predictable, How Bayesian Statistics Explain Our Worlds. Its release date was this past weekend in the U.S., May 7th, at most large retailers. So let's dive in. So we're launching the podcast a couple days after, but (laughs) we are super excited to have you on the show, Tom. How are you doing this morning? (laughs) I'm very well, thank you. Yes, yeah, it's it's fun to talk about the Bayes stuff. I'm still having to remember a, a lot of the stuff because I because I wrote the book a long time ago, but it's a uh, year and a year ago now. But it's still it's it's exciting, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as I do. Yes, actually, I I read the whole book. Oh wow! <laughs> and, yeah, <laughs> cover to cover, and um, I I have been actually jazzed about interviewing you for this because I. My background is industrial engineering and mm. mathematics. <laughs> and, you know, you talk about the things that mathematicians, you, you think everybody goes from one thing to the next to the next, and that stuff is boring. Mm-hmm. Right? Math is yeah. boring. It's not. We it's have not. a lot of quirks. Mm. There's a lot of interesting things about it. There's a lot of, there's yeah. a lot of, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of ways it interacts with like decision making and, and how we live our lives and actually you can use some sim- quite simple maths i mean that's the thing i like about bayes theorem is that it's actually it's really simple in its sort of conceptual stuff i mean it's all like um it's multiplication and division you know my my 8 year old daughter could do all the all the basics that you require for it but it has these really profound implications for so many areas of the world i will say i'm absolutely thrilled that you've read the whole book I, 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 that's, I think you're the first person i've met who's done that who doesn't literally work on it so that's very cool <laughs> so yes i actually i love reading a lot of different math books and mm. just science in general and i'm curious how did you get involved in science journalism and writing right okay so i mean well obviously like any good science journalist i have a degree in philosophy. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. So I, I, I started out just, I was, when I was, when I was young, I was just, 
always just interested in stuff. I was like, I was always like an intellectual like magpie. I wanted to learn about as many different things as I could. And the way that you get to do that at university is to do philosophy. So you do philosophy of whatever, philosophy of science, philosophy of mind, yes. philosophy of language. You know, um, after uni, I um, well, after I did when after that, I did sort of mass. I did a, a like more study, more, more more time at university, doing a master's degree, and then st- started but never completing a PhD, which was in sort of ethics of science, particularly. And then, um, and I the PhD was in the ethics of science journalism. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. Completely made up nonsense. Had never worked a day as a journalist in my life, so it was like being a I mean... like a yeah <laughs> yeah. It was a bit crazy, but um, it was I was being it was, it was like being a like a, I don't know a lepidopterist who's never seen a butterfly or something you know it's uh, it's uh, it was it was a weird decision but anyway after that I had to go and get a proper job fell by sheer fluke into a um job at the, a national newspaper and then uh and sort of steered my way towards sciencey things from there because was what I was interested in and um how I ended up getting involved in the book particularly I I read I, I've sort of been aware of Bayes' theorem for years. I remember reading about it in um, this British journalist or um, a sort of medical doctor called Ben Goldacre's columns in the early 2000s. And it was just, you know, how, what, I remember finding it, what do you mean a test can be 99% accurate, but there's not a 99% chance that it's right? I don't understand what you mean. And I just found it fascinating. But then, and so both of my previous books, I've, it's played a pretty central role in them because I just find it so interesting and it seems so, so crucial to um, sort of our understanding of so much. But what particularly drove me to write this book was that in my, my last book had a chapter on Bayes. I wrote an article about it for the, for a British newspaper, um, the observer and the editor put in, it's just an after, you know, not, very, not as a big deal. They put, he described it as a, like how this obscure theorem just describes the world or something like that, you know, in the, in like the, yes. in what I think the Americans call, or Americans call the deck, you know, the, the, the headline, the bit below the headline that isn't the main, yes. you anyway, put it there, you know, it drove people mad, absolutely mad. I had like four days of people raging in my Twitter mentions going, you know, um, like, how do you dare you call a, you know, the base obscure? It's central to probability theory and all this sort of stuff. Like, well, yeah, you, you, I, I get where they were coming from, but actually, I bet you ninety percent of the population has no idea what Bayes' theorem is. No idea. Like, so I, I felt, like, you know, ninety percent of mathematics professors uh, and graduate students had at least one question wrong. So, yeah. yeah, do they know what statistics is? You know, yes, you, exactly, exactly. Who's a fine oiled machine who's taught this? They're like, th- there's human error. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so anyway, so I got, I got. It was uh, after like three days of what I ended up describing as obscure gate because I just, it was like one of the biggest, it was hilarious, you know, this enormous Twitter storm or it feels enormous when you're in the middle of it over what you know, this incredibly it's sort always of always enormous Twitter storm. Yeah, exactly. So I, um, uh, so yeah. So after that, I was sort of driven by pure spite really, because they were like professors of biostatistics and these sort of, and I remember a Stanford, uh, PhD is uh, Stan- Stanford statistics PhD guy all weighing in and getting all snotty about it and I was like you know what I'm gonna write a goddamn book about this uh, I'm gonna write a book and it will be about Bayes theorem and it will show you know, anyway so, so I did that and uh, that's what you have now read it is a product it of is, pure spite it, it is the most brilliant uh spite book yes thank you that's really kind as, as I like to say surviving and thriving out of spite yeah no it was and a lot here of fun. we are yes exactly <laughs> So, um, beyond that, like, where where does the story start for Bayes' theorem? I know science and religion just don't mix, hmm. but now you have math and religion and Thomas Bayes. So I'm curious how the how narrative gets, yeah. came along. Yes. Yeah. yeah well, so so Bayes Bayes himself was at the sort of end of like he was he he was a there'd been a couple of hundred years probably of people thinking or certainly 150 years people thinking about probability up before before Bayes um and you know that they'd been trying to work out things like you know uh oh, the, the classic thing is the problem of the points okay the, which was firm uh Fermat of last last theorem fame per, per, um and Pascal uh Blaise Pascal another great French mathematician working out like if you imagine two people playing a simple dice game or something how do you work out and and they have to stop the game before it finishes how do you work out 
what what the fair way split the pot is. So like if I've got two points and you've got one and it's a first, game of first to three, what's the, you know, coin tossing or whatever, what's the fair way to split the pot? And, they, and there've been centuries of working this out. Like, should it be like, I've got two and you've got one, therefore I should have twice as much as you or whatever. And they had the insight that it's about how, um, how you, uh, how many, how many sort of, out, how many outcomes there are from where you are. And so, so yes. in, a, in a two to one game, uh, then there's the, out of there are four possible outcomes remaining and the guy who's two to one ahead would win in three out of four so the fair thing is to split it three ways three parts to one anyway so the the probabilities sort of went uh, went down this route and it was and then Bernoulli was looking at things like the law of large numbers but all what all these people were doing was looking at how likely it is how likely you are to see some result like for example a yeah player one winning or player two winning or you know number number a number of balls drawn from some urn full of black and white balls whatever that sort of thing how, how likely you are to see some result given a hypothesis like you know uh, or given some state of the world like the people are playing a game but but what statisticians and scientists really want from probability is to be able to say how likely it is it that my hypothesis is true how you know if i could do a covid vaccine trial say right if i I that how likely is it that and and I get you know in in the placebo arm ten people get COVID and in the in the in the treatment arm the actual vaccine arm one person does the the um uh, the what's it called the vaccine didn't work that would be the same yes. sort of, you know that would be the problem but I can't but what we want to know is how likely is it that my vaccine does work how likely is it you know what what's the probability yeah. that my hypothesis is true and it was only Bayes who. It was when Bayes did it that he that Bayes was the first person to come up with that uh, way of doing, it. and he realised you have to use prior probability, you have to use your subjective ex- uh, estimate of how likely things were before. And yeah, the the religion side of thing was well, he was a he was a Presbyterian minister, well, not pre- a nonconformist minister. So yeah. a, um, uh, in England in the 18th century, there you weren't allowed; you, you had to follow either the Church of England's. Uh, rules i mean this is obviously quite relevant to america because a lot of americans yes. left for that exact reason uh or they weren't americans at the time um but the oh yeah so Bayes was you know he had to go he wasn't allowed to study in english universities had to go to edinburgh and scotland he you know he, he couldn't preach in official c of e churches and all sort of stuff but anyway he he was also a as well as being a preacher he was a and I say this with enormous love, but he was—he was a real nerd. He was a massive nerd, right? He was a—he was a, a hobbyist mathematician. You know, he anyone was a, listening to the podcast is a massive nerd. Yeah, of course, and I say, and I and I love the them as well. You know, I, I consider myself very much a nerd, right? That's my—that's that's my whole thing. You know, I guess um, with at least a master's degree, if not a PhD. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. It's a strong possibility. Strong yeah. Give, possibility that someone's a nerd. Yeah. You can do a Bayesian thing there. What's your your, your prior probability of someone being a nerd is like what well, you know probably about five percent. When you feel here, they've got a master's degree in something that should go up by at least three uh, at least threefold. Anyway. Um. Yeah. The. Uh, so he. Yeah. So he was. Um. He'd got involved with this whole sort of coterie of uh, other hobbyist mathematicians hanging around in. Um, southern england around this one lord stanhope guy who funded them all and let them it was just it was a bit like um i had someone comparing to me like rich people nowadays might get involved in sports teams and stuff you know yeah. now, but back then they got involved in science they spent their endless leisure hours writing papers for the royal society and that sort of stuff um where religion also comes into it you might like is that um after after Bayes' death his friend richard price um who was a uh, which I, I love this detail. He was a friend of Benjamin Franklin's and a friend of um, John Adams and I think Thomas Jefferson. Like I, I was, uh, I'd have to look back in the book, but yeah, a friend of these amazing founding fathers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he um he was another nonconformist preacher, and he was very interested in using Bayes' theorem. Here is one who published the, the the theorem after Bayes' death in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, and he um he wanted to to use Bayes' theorem to protect, to, to uh, defend God, defend the idea of God from Hume, uh, David Hume, the philosopher, because Hume had, yeah. uh, Hume had sort of said, like, to, you know, the, the classic thing of um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You know, if you want to say that a miracle has happened, it needs to be more plausible that the miracle happened than that the person who's telling you about the miracle is lying to you. Um, yeah. And so, so he's saying you can never really believe in, Biblical miracles, for instance, and 
Price obviously being a preacher, being a, a man of God, he wanted to say, actually, it is possible for um, unexpected things to happen, and you can never be certain that they don't. And he used Bayes' theorem, which right baked into the maths of it pretty much is the impossibility of ever finding certainty um although that might be a bit of a paradox now i say it out loud um but the uh the, you know the, the um he was saying that it was impossible to you know no matter how many times you see the sun coming up you can never be sure they didn't another another time and he therefore argued that you know, no matter how many times you see people not coming back from the dead, for instance, it doesn't mean it didn't happen in the past. So he was using it as a way of defending, um, you know, the biblical tradition from Hume. With I, I'm not saying not saying he was successful at that, but that yep. was the idea. Okay, okay. So <laughs> with that, uh, hmm. out of out of curiosity, where does this go with? innovations in science and math and how does this play into like what we're doing now okay right well so so <laughs> well, um, finish, finish the question sorry i talked sure. over there. so like mm. what if there were there was one overarching theory that could help explain much of our modern day lives right mm. so we're looking at how does this play into ai more <laughs> yeah the big topics that we yeah about. yeah so, I mean, the the classic Bayes theorem application is usually medicine, right? Um, yeah. That's how we, you know, th it usually comes along. Uh, people talking about cancer screening or COVID tests. You know, if if someone says a test is ninety nine percent specific and ninety nine percent sensitive, so that is it only returns if you are if you have the condition that you're testing for, it only returns a false negative one time in a hundred, let's say it's 99%, you know, or if you don't have the condition, it will only return a false positive one time in a hundred. So that sounds like it should be. If you take the test, there's only a one in a hundred chance and it comes back positive. There's only a one in a hundred chance that it's a false positive. Right. But I, I was thinking about this the other day, what the best, best way of demonstrating it was. And I was saying, you know, imagine that I went and took a medical test for some condition or other, and it, we know that it's that it only returns false positives one time in a hundred. And I go and take the test and I get a positive result. How likely is it that I have the disease? And most people would probably say, oh, you know, one in a hundred. But then if I said, but what if it was a pregnancy test? Um, and then what if most it's one of the new rapid COVID tests that nobody is showing positive for? Yeah. Or well, you get a box and that it shows that you're positive. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, if 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 it was a, if it was a if it was a um a guy who looks like me taking a pregnancy test, then the most the most of us would think the the chances are it's more likely that it's a false positive than yes. that it's a true positive. Even if true positives are uh, false positives are pretty rare, because you know, if you test a hundred people, you might get the false positive once in it, and it, that's more likely to happen than that I am unexpectedly pregnant. Yeah, I'm quite old now. So it would be surprising, um, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I know it. yeah, well, exactly, exactly. It's still hope yet. Um, but the, uh, um, so that's the classic thing, you know, so if you do a cancer test and you get this very accurate cancer, uh, cancer test, but it return, it returns positive. You can't know how likely you are to have cancer unless you know how likely it was that you had cancer in the first place. You need to compare the hypothesis, the likelihood of the hypothesis. This is a false positive. To the likelihood of the hypo or the chance of the hypothesis, this is a you know, um, I have this very rare cancer, you know. So, it, so, but what Bayes' theorem does is, is force you to look at the, how likely the two two um, the two hypotheses are, and that and that means you have to know how likely it was it, your thing was in the first place. And that, so, so it is. So that's the classic application. But it comes into a million different varieties. I mean, you mentioned law. The um, uh, th sure. there's a there's a well, classic you thing. Have court cases, right? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You have you have you have um, the thing called the prosecutor's fallacy, yes, which is um, uh, literally just not thinking like a Bayesian. Really, it is um, it is that you a, a lot of times a, a, a prosecutor will say in a, a court, you know a court case, for example, there's there's there was an awful awful case in the UK which I uh, I really shudder to think about. But this poor woman, two of her two of her babies died of cot death. Um, uh, and it was um that's a very rare condition and a, a a doctor told the court that you know since the condition is only only happens i don't i can't remember it was one in 17,000 times or something like that yep. he said that um 
uh, that well, you know, one in seventeen thousand times one in seventeen thousand is one in whatever it was, you know, some number of yes. millions, uh, and therefore the chance that this woman is innocent is only one in how many millions, you know, and she went to prison. But as other people, as statisticians pointed out, what he's done there is the Bayesian mistake of assuming that the chance of seeing something the happen. Ch- yeah, the, ch- the chance of seeing this result, given a hypothesis, is not the same as the chance that this hypothesis is true, given a result, any more than that it's than saying only one in eight billion humans is the Pope is the same as only one, a one in eight billion chance that the Pope is human. You know, that's, they're, they're just yeah. different. They're, it's, you're, you're, the, they are different questions, fundamentally different questions. And you have, what you need to do is compare the likelihood of the probability, the likelihood that a, um, uh, the, this test came back, uh, the, the, these, um, the, 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 this was a coincidence versus the likelihood of a woman being a double murderer, which is also extremely unlikely. You know, mm-hmm. so you need you need to compare hypotheses. So that so it comes into it absolutely comes into the law. Where I mean, with with AI, it's fascinating in a way because all modern all AIs are really doing is is statistical probability predicting stuff. Yeah, exactly. It is predicting stuff. So whether it's you know when we say. Um, uh, that chat GPT, we ask chat GPT to say, uh, we ask, you know, how it, we, we ask it, how are you? And it says, I'm very well, thank you. It's not doing that because it is very well. It's just predicting that that's the sort of thing a human would expect to hear or would say, given that string, yeah. that, that prompt, right? Um, and obviously what Bayes is, is the maths of prediction. But the, the, like, the, when we make good, uh, your prior is a prediction and you update your prediction with new information, new evidence. And the... Um, uh, and when you're doing something like a um, LLM yep. <laughs> with mm. AI, you have your basic like language. You have the language learning model there that mm. just takes it from what you're doing, and it automatically will predict the next few words. Yes, of, yeah, and it just makes things much more well easier for people to just think about and just hit the tab mm. button when they're just writing something. Or you just go to that next thing, right? Hmm. <laughs> and you can go to your next thought automatically. But here, yeah. but what is the danger of that when we're thinking about that with ethics, right? So <laughs> it's. I mean, that's a bigger question, isn't it? I mean, I, I, what, what I will say about LLMs that I find difficult. There's a lot of people saying that you know it's just. It's just predicting what we'll say next. Now, I th- always find people put the word just before things. And yeah. I always think that like, he's, he's just flying by flapping his arms. You know, like he's just running 100 meters in 9.6 seconds. It's very easy to say just, but actually predicting things is very difficult. And that's why humans are good at surviving in the world, because we predict what the world will be like, which, you know, like a stone can't do that. Right. Um, so, but so AI, they do, there's evidence they do build models. But yes, there is. The world is slightly off the topic of the book, maybe, but it's definitely going to be the world's going to have a complicated time working out the ethics of how AI, you know, as AIs predict what humans would do to, you know, at, um, to create art, for instance. And we, uh, we're, suddenly we've got, um, you know, the, uh, machines that can create beautiful art for us, which isn't human made. How do we deal with that? Is it copyright? That, that's all, that's going to be very complicated. And I don't know how, I, Luckily, it, I don't have as, to answer those questions. So it's been popping up in um, a lot of trading card games. Really? Yes. So a lot of the artists that are in the small, I'll say smaller art market. Yeah. Um, th- there's been posters that have been put out by. Um, uh, hmm. So there have been trading card games <laughs> in which hmm. we have seen the art. And yeah. usually the people that play it that are very competitive. I know that I'm a competitive mm. uh, trading card game. And cool. on many occasions, you look at the cards, you look at the art, and you say, was this done by the artist? Was this done mm. by a certain person? Was this faked, right? Mm. <laughs> and you, you know that there's certain features in the art, even if it is AI generated. Where mm. do you look at these things? You look at the fine details. You look mm. at the border for somebody's shirt, right? Yeah. You look at the tiny patterns in there. And 
the predictability, I will yeah. say, and cohesiveness of something, if you're looking at a big picture, it looks fabulous. Yeah. You zoom in on something that's smaller, fine detail, you'll realize that instead of a square, it goes square on one side of your shirt, and yeah. then it'll be a circle on the other, for like the oh, lace or the border. Yeah. And then if you were looking at something like body armor, right? Mm. <laughs> It will have like a triple border somewhere and you'll think of like on your shoulder pads. Then you look a chest piece and it only has a single border or a double mm. border and things are not cohesive in that sense. <laughs> okay. So they're not doing a brilliant job at well. I, I will say like, they're not, they, <laughs> that's exactly, that's, uh, look yeah. how fine you have to look at, you know, imagine five years ago an AI doing that and it wouldn't get anywhere near, you know, the progress Absolutely. they made has been astonishing. Absolutely. And it's just that, you know, it's all those fine details hmm. for the AI. I don't know if it will ever line up to the human expectation. Even as someone, so so think of it a bubble, right? Yeah. You cannot get every single pattern predictably correct. I would say. No. Okay, sorry, carry on. I would say AI and machine learning have a great are a great aid to getting the mm. result that we need however when you're looking at the very fine details of say a mathematical proof that we haven't solved yet yeah um if we're looking at some sort of new discovery uh, we can only look at these things based on the facts that we already have and just knowing that the majority of things I will say for AI, it will be correct within two standard deviations. I think that's probably I, well. I, I certainly think that's true now. I'm I'm I, I've been because I wrote my my first book was about AI, right? Um, and that was I came out in what 2019, so five you know, and I was writing it in about 20, five years ago. Yeah, about five years ago, which is ridiculous. Okay, that's, that's obviously obviously can't be right. You know, 2019 is not five years ago, but somehow it is. Um, no, but, it's uh, ne never, yeah, never. Can't be, can't be. Yeah. Anyway, so it uh, and I remember when I was writing that, it was still like it was still pretty big news that a an AI could re AI image classifier could reliably tell the difference between a cat and a dog. Uh, and now we are well past that, you know, and, and back then it was rely it was like, um, there was, um, it, but not long before then, less, you know, a few, three or four years before then there was that famous XKCD comic about a, um, someone saying the, uh, you know, the, um, can, can you write me a, some script that can take, tell me where this photo was taken, whether this photo was taken in a national park easy i can do that in a second and then tell me sure. whether there's a photo of a bird and then well nope that's gonna take me five years you know five years in a massive research team it's just the um the the progress has been astounding and i agree there's a strong you know the edge cases constantly get harder and you see this with um self-driving cars the the, the the it'll get ironing out the last little wrinkles gets harder and harder getting closer and yeah. closer to per perfection it, it, you know you get more diminishing returns that said, I am very wary of betting against them not doing it to a significant degree because I do think you just look at how much better it's gotten in the last few years, and I, I you know, I, I, I agree. At the moment, you can always detect little things, or often detect little things that aren't quite right, but it happens less and less with each thing that comes out. Yes, the hardest things in art to do are so. Th this comes as more of a blanket statement. So yeah. I, I usually combine my background is. Partially in art, partially in math. So I yeah. do a lot of like origami mm. <laughs> and oh, cool. mathematics um, and of that sort. But when you're looking at art, even as an artist, even as an illustrator doing computer generated stuff, um, the big thing that we look at is the fine details of hands, mm. <laughs> hand posture. Yeah. And it has proven relatively true that 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 being able to create any sort of toes hands i'll say phalanges in general yeah. is is one of the most difficult fine-tuned things for ai and an artist to be able to do yeah i mean that's obviously there was, it was only about a year ago <laughs> yeah. they just couldn't do it you could always look and no, i've got six fingers you know yes um, and but, it, at the moment so say may of 2024 it's mm. still of that sort of issue <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, but I, I but I mean then I, I will my two comebacks to that. Not that I'm disagreeing with you exactly, but yeah. Again, the I think the the hands problem is is less dramatic from what I'm looking at like the output from things like mid journey now. It's less dramatic than it was. You know, they they reliably have five fingers most of the time now. Sometimes they then have two left hands or something. You know, it's it's like it's um um it's, it's by no means <laughs> we never uh, you... said it was a right hand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I mean, I will also say that hands are like it's not as if humans get hands right. Like you look at the bits that humans draw and get it wrong. Even like the front, you, I know, and uh, uh, there was I can't remember who it was exactly, but there was some um comic book artist who you noticed always seemed to have hands hidden behind stuff and things because they couldn't you know, because they were such a pain like even like professional artists struggle with hands so i, yeah. I, I want to give the the ais a bit of a pass on some uh, of this stuff you know <laughs> yep that absolutely now out of curiosity where are these major predictions that we have whether it has been an ai or whether it's in a court of law politics voting where are these things going wrong well, I mean, one way in which predictions... So, okay. So, like, an, an obvious way in which predictions go wrong is... as Well, it is in um, conspiracy theories, right? I, I think this is, a, this is a thing that we um, might not think of as being a, a, a Bayesian phenomenon, but it kind of is, because, like, what Bayes tells us is um, that how what how our predictions of the world and therefore how we interpret incoming evidence is very much based on what we already believe that's like, that's yeah. our priors and our and our um and that we our, we update our prior probabilities with new evidence to come with our posterior probabilities and um there's a sort of what what that what the with conspiracy theories in particular i think what i should st stress first is that like all human activity is to some extent predicting stuff when we when we are uh you know each each breath we take when we, or when we when we're making any sort of decision we're predicting that this decision will be better than the other decision that will have these outcomes that we you know and but when we when we have beliefs about the world they are sort of predictions about how the world will behave so it's, it, very crucially a lot of the book is about how you can really think about human senses human beliefs human behavior as a very bayesian phenomenon with with um prior probabilities we update from the world now what that implies is that predictions when when people hold false beliefs or what you might call conspiratorial beliefs, they they should in theory get updated with um, new information. So if like if you believe that the 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 USA never went to the moon, for instance, that the moon landings were hoaxed, you uh, you should be able to update that information up that you know when as new information loads of photos come back from the moon and loads of people tell you who you trust that these you know the, the news yeah. they, they'll they'll tell you no we did go to the moon look here's this photo of you know the flag flying on the moon here's the photo of now if there were just the two options or the two just the two hypotheses of uh either we didn't go to the moon or we did then this new information should update you to it towards it. But because of the way, um, because there are multiple hypotheses and because someone has a very strong prior that these, um, that they, they didn't. And that then when, the, when you can explain this in evidence of photos coming from the moon, you can explain it in one of two ways. You can explain it either they're real photos from the moon or people are trying to lie to us and trick to it, trick us. And they set up a, a studio back lot in, you know, Hollywood. And it's actually, what, who was it? Stanley, um, uh, Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick. Yes. There we go. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Uh, I, did, I just went to do a quick Google search. Uh -oh. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I was, I was quick enough. I was pleased. Um, but yeah, so, so th what that means is when you get these two competing hypotheses, they, they, you, when when new evidence comes in that is compatible with with not compatible with your original hypothesis, your, your, origi your original idea that we didn't go to the moon, and but and and that's the end of it. It can you can either move move your your confidence towards actually we did go to the moon, or it can go move your move your increase your confidence in the hypothesis people are lying to me, and that's how very, when you people have got very strong priors in something, very strong beliefs in something, they can they, the same evidence that would convince you or me to believe we did actually go to the moon will convince them that the mainstream media is lying to them and that the um and so, and so we, it, I find this really interesting because. It allows you to say this is how people end up with conspiratorial beliefs or different beliefs from the same evidence without saying these people are strange and weird and somehow wrong and bad. You know, you can just say, well, they had different beliefs to start with. And from that different starting belief, they have actually they're updating rationally with the new new evidence. And I, I think that's a it's a more 
I don't know. Otherwise, you're forced to say people who believe the Earth is flat or that. Um, I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah, that's is the classic, Earth isn't it? Flat? Is it yeah. flat? And did we go to the moon? <laughs> yeah. Or you know, vaccines are uh, vaccines cause autism or whatever. You know, yes. the, the more or um or the uh, PizzaGate stuff that the um the United States is run by a cabal out of a pizza restaurant in Washington. You know, that's yep. uh, that's that the, these things. Which I, to be clear, I'm not I'm I'm not convinced about myself. I, I don't think they're necessarily completely true. Anyway, the um yeah. So the uh, so <laughs> big one. Here's the yeah. big one for the U.S. We have the election coming up with it, right? Yeah, the better candidate. <laughs> Well, oh God, if I'm going to get, um, yeah, oh. yeah, um, but yeah, the, I, I do have opinions. This episode. <laughs> yeah, I, um, but you see what I mean, like so. Th- but that's exactly it. You can see the, right. the um, when a a politician gives a speech, um, that you know, that, that 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 it's there. There's lots of sort of people talking about how you know the, the, there was there was a classic bit of um, research showing that people will have different opinions about a speech when they learn that it is by Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama or Donald Trump or George Bush, whatever. Yeah. And, and people say, well, that's, that's, um, people get, get annoyed about that. And they said, well, you know, this just shows that people are irrational and they, they, they base their policy op- opinions on who says things rather than on the policies themselves. But actually it's perfectly rational. I trust some politicians less than other politicians because of my priors. And that's a purely I mean- Bayesian thing, right? I, I have my prior beliefs about stuff. And so, it makes you know if likewise if someone if einstein were to come and tell me that the um uh, that space time is uh that time is relative to space and all that sort of stuff i'm okay you you seem you, you i trust you you know what you're talking about but if sort of like john p nobody off the street comes and tells me that i'm i will be a bit more sort of I, I don't know what you're talking about that but obviously we do know that einstein was right but you know that you can do you have there isn't such a thing as trusting people and uh having priors in their in their trustworthy and in the trustworthiness and that makes perfect sense like the biggest thing that i all i have to say is that hmm. you know you can't trust somebody who has been a convicted felon anybody that knows that anything about the u.s politics a ham sandwich yeah. is better than both candidates <laughs> Oh, it's going to be a tough year, isn't it? And it's going to be a tough yes, year. And, and on top of that, at, have you heard of someone named Vernon Supreme? I don't think so, no. He, oh, lovely. Um, yeah, it makes sense. He wears a boot upside down on his head. We have guys like that here, yep. Okay, it gets mm. better. Um, half of his stuff, <laughs> mm. you'll get a good giggle out of this one. Uh, half of his stuff makes more sense than the current political state of the U.S. <laughs> yeah. And he believes yeah. that there should be a miniature pony that is an emotional support animal for every household. <laughs> there's um, there's there are guys like that in the UK. There is the the um the monster raving loony party puts up can- candidates at every at most elections, and there's like a, there's a guy called Count Binface who turns up wearing oh, a garbage can that. over his head. Yeah, yep. And and actually, there we there there was there was you know sometimes it's quite funny he comes up with quite good and some and they they do he did i think he got more than the conservative party candidate one election yep. i can't remember the details of it. i, I yeah. think the, the best one here that is currently running as an independent mm. it's an independent politician they changed their they legally changed their name to literally anybody else <laughs> <laughs> that's good i like that i like that that's funny no it was a good <laughs> Yeah, that, 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 that gets a laugh. I like that. That's nice. <laughs> when seeing that. Hmm. So, you know, every every single uh, prediction, we, we do need a laugh. And yes. Especially with, as mathematicians, I'm going to bring it back to something that you do have in the book. Uh, I'll call it a little Easter egg. Um, yeah. Mathematics conferences always get interesting. <laughs> yes. Yes, they do. Um, so. What is going on with the University of Minnesota? <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, I don't know why it's on the service of the University of Minnesota, but there were these amazing. Um, uh, I will try and I'll. There, there were these amazing conferences. Yes. Bayes, so Bayes, so firstly, right, Bayesian statistics, as we've established, are the only way of saying this is how likely my hypothesis is to be true, given the evidence. But most most scientific statistics never uh, 
because in the early 20th century, scientific statistics moved away from that. They went towards um, what we now call frequentist statistics, which is the exact opposite. The how likely am I to see this result given a hypothesis, which which is people, you know, has pros and cons. But, you know, a lot of people, well, got a, a lot of people didn't like it and, and were sort of quietly using Bayesian stuff in the background. And in the 70s, it started to come out a bit more into the open and people that they had started having these... Um, uh these conferences particularly in and around valencia which were um uh which honestly sounded pretty crazy um they they was uh they were the first sort of real bayesian world meetings and they had they have um the, the first the at first they were just you know in the daytime because it's very hot they'd be they'd do their work in the morning they'd have a siesta they'd do small work sort of six till ten in the evening and then they would have big parties where they all sing it was great. They'd, um, they'd. Uh, I, I won't try and sing it because I'm not a natural singing voice sort of person. But there was a, um, excuse me. But there was a, uh, there was a song called uh, Thomas Bayes' Army from the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the Reverend Thomas Bayes. He's stamping out frequentists and their incoherent ways and all sort of stuff. They, they it goes on for ages. And they, they, there were these drinking. You know, they, had, they, they had. Um, Bayesians in the night to this tune of strangers in the night and they're yeah. uh, like a Bayesian like a virgin it was, there was the one the full Monte Carlo which had a bunch of middle-aged statistics professors taking off their clothes on in front of, of in a <laughs> in a uh, uh, on, on stage in front of a screaming crowd it was it, it sounds it sounds like a lot of fun honestly that actually sounds like a normal math conference really oh that's lovely oh that's good so it's not too far from the truth at least some of the dinner parties <laughs> That, that, I, don't know about, I don't know about uh some of the clothes being taken off <laughs> no that, <laughs> that that might be more than we need but yeah the um uh the um the, the fact that you tell me other other maths conferences also do it that there was there was one guy said that he had a sweatshirt saying bayesians have more fun but maybe that's not true maybe they maybe all mathematicians have loads of fun i don't know <laughs> All I can hear is someone singing "Glory, Glory, Probability." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, told, yeah, I, I was tempted to break into song. I just thought it's probably not. It's not best for. It's not for the best. It, um, but yeah, the, it, it does sound like it was a, a load of a load of fun. They they also um, apparently one one of the Bayesian statisticians who was there says that they all they all went for a, they all took a boat out and went for a swim off the coast off the coast and then. Um, the winds got up. The boat blew away when they were lost. When they were stuck in the water, and he says there was a, there was a decent chance that like half of the um half of the top the top Bayesian st st statistics professors in the world would have all drowned in one particular in one moment. They they were rescued. It was fine, but that would have set back <laughs> the Bay Bayesian statistics quite badly if that had happened. Um, I think out of all of the songs that so far that I've heard is mm. that there's no theorem like Bayes theorem. There's <laughs> no, no theorem we <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, it's great isn't it what yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. The, these are these are all they're i mean they're, they're they're nerds letting their hair down aren't they it's 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 great i absolutely love it they um yeah they they that, that was that was at the sort of when bayesianism was starting to come back into uh into vogue and because i think you know a lot of people had independently rediscovered it over the decades before but you know ronald fisher and people had sort of tried to stamp out Bayesianism in the in like 1920s, pretty much. But the people like Alan Turing independently rediscovered it because you you need it. You cannot you cannot work out how likely something is without Bayes. So and people want to know how likely stuff is. You know when you're doing code breaking or when you're doing uh, people are using it for artillery, working out artillery or mechanics. Lots of Silicon Valley. It was reinvented several times in Silicon Valley by Absolutely. people just like yeah. And uh, so you you just you just need it. You you need it. So um you need it over. For from like stock market predictions to weather forecasting and yeah, yeah. even self-driving cars yeah absolutely and anything that is making a prediction yes uh the making predictions un under uncertainty you need bays and uh, and that that whether that's a, a the human brain or yeah a self-driving car or google maps or um yeah code breakers anything like that you you cannot do it artificial intelligence in general you just cannot do it without bays and so the um uh in the in the mid twentieth late the mid to late twentieth century, it, it, it came back in and people realised that it's important. I mean, it is still it is still not standard in science. Still, most scientific research is done using frequentist models. So that is things like p values. Yeah, you know, when we declare something statistically significant, that's a that's a frequentist model that is saying I I will be un this this result that we found will be unlikely to happen by chance. So under the hypothesis 
that there is no result here that there is no effect here i would be i would only see it one time in 20 or something which is which is the opposite of how likely is my hypothesis to be true given this result but nonetheless it is uh it, 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 the the bayesian systems are getting more common there are ways it's you know i was being a pharmaceutical um a statistician who worked in pharma com- in pharma industry for a long time he's saying again you, you just you just you need this to be able to say i think this drug is 75 percent likely to work or whatever you cannot you cannot make statements like that without using Bayes. and I, I think it's it's great that it's coming back more into mainstream and obviously it explains a thousand other things as well yes now out of curiosity what is something that you want people to know out the book that you want to drive home <laughs> yeah. to the audience to anyone who's listening about this sure okay well i mean probably the idea the, the thing i tell you what i tell you what my sort of takeaway from sort of a life from a life uh using it in my in my own life sort of thing has been um that when we talk about the, the pr- intelligence is about prediction Every, everything that humans do that everything that ai does everything is about predicting and that, that's bayesian priors and so on but what what that what it is what's what's really crucial well so there so the two the two things that fall out of that right are firstly you don't have to say i think this thing is going to happen or i think this thing is true you have you can say i i'm i i have you know, i'm 80 percent sure that this thing happens and then you can update or uh, up and down with more information and it, it means you don't have to sort of doggedly defend some position i definitely think politician x is good or whatever you say i i have a strong probability that, that this person is going to do good things if they get into office and, I, and then when i get new information oh god they're not as good as i thought i can bring it down a bit rather than just saying and now i abandon that belief i don't have to sort of have yes or no answers to everything i can have probability estimates on stuff also i think it's really we spend an awful lot of time arguing especially on the internet because everyone argues on the internet and god knows i do as well is this thing you know, <laughs> yes exactly is this thing you know is, is this i don't know is it woke is it racist is it eugenics is it uh, is this thing does cancel culture exist all these names and things that we put on stuff oh, right of course it does well Speaking but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah but when we have these arguments we're just we're, no quite often people don't actually disagree about any of the facts as you know we, with, with the cancel culture example no one's sort of really arguing that they that people haven't lost their jobs because of things they've said they're just trying to say that there's no argument over whether we should call that phenomenon cancel culture and i what the thing about that what Bayes tells you is beliefs are predictions if I call it cancel culture, if I don't, does it change any predictions I make about the world? If it doesn't, no. maybe we, maybe, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think it does. But so maybe we oh. can just say, it doesn't matter what we call it. I predict that if you said these certain things on a podcast, then you would probably be at risk of losing your job, which is why I'm so careful about things I say on podcasts. Uh, yeah, um, and that whether you can choose to call that cancel culture or not, but the point is, I may, beliefs should be predictions about the world. Beliefs that you hold should imply some prediction that then can be falsified or not it can can come true or not and therefore can adjust your 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 those probabilities down the line if they don't have any if there's no sort of prediction attached to a belief then kind of what's the point in it you know call it cancel culture call it not whatever that doesn't matter you're just we're just arguing about a word rather than about any sort of facts about the world and i think that is the biggest takeaway for me is that you should that beliefs should have probabilities and predictions attached and if they don't they're kind of meaningless wonderful cool (laughs) and anything else that you would like to add Uh, i mean only that you should go and buy my book obviously um i think that's that's probably the crucial thing i I thought it was very entertaining (laughs) that's brilliant i mean that's what i go for It, it it is it is not always easy to write books about maths that are funny i've tried to do it i think sometimes i've succeeded and i i, I think that's that, i think that's it was actually quite brilliant i was reading through it and i'm like i i, I try to do a book when i sit down i do a book in a day <laughs> oh wow that's very impressive <laughs> so usually if i can enjoy it in an afternoon a couple hundred mm. pages in an afternoon you have done well brilliant <laughs> well, well I'm, I'm honestly i'm thrilled to hear that i'm absolutely thrilled that's really lovely Yes. So, and in that case, I, I thank you for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. It really it, has it's been an absolute pleasure. Cool. Well, thank you, Autumn. Um, yeah. And uh, if I could just reiterate my point about everyone should yeah. definitely buy the book, that would be great. Yeah.